know that I'm used to the climate A thing that if man ever found A place to live easy and happy That Eden is on Puget Sound Eden is on Puget Sound That Eden is on Puget Sound A place to live easy and happy Hello, you are listening to The Seattle Files. My name is Chris Allen, I'm your host. Every week I get together with a different local comedian, and together we discuss the strange, unusual, interesting, and oftentimes lesser-known aspects of our local history. Joining me today on the program is David Gordon. How's it going, David? It is going super. Excellent. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, David is an ensemble member in Comedy Sports Seattle. You can see him playing there many weekends. He also performs with Split Second Improv in Redmond. Uh, he is a uh, technical behind-the-scenes guy running lights and sounds, creating audio audio effects and doing a lot of different kinds of tech stuff that uh, uh, most theater people don't know how to do, but he does, which makes him incredibly valuable. I've been called a wizard many times. Ah, yes. And he is also uh, uh, the, the the man behind the one-man show, Professor Gordon Explanifies Everything, um, which performs intermittently a couple times a year. Yeah, and I've, I've been doing it once every couple months for the last little bit, but we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Cool. And you said you have a, a wizard uh, rock persona <laughs> that you mentioned before? Oh, oh, geez. I didn't know we were going to be talking about that. Uh, yeah, for uh, a couple of years between uh, 2007 2008, I was regularly performing in uh, libraries and bookstores under the name Alas Earwax, uh, doing original music about uh, the Harry Potter universe. How could we not bring that up <laughs> considering, I just found out about this maybe 90 <laughs> seconds before we started recording but I think that's awesome. Uh, the MySpace page still exists <laughs> so uh, if if you're interested uh, I think it's MySpace.com slash Earwax Rock. Oh that's great. Uh, and uh, you know if you want to buy a copy of my album uh, Alas Earwax and the Power of Sheer Luck and More Talented Friends, I've still got about 10 copies of my self-produced CD. So. Oh that is great. Yep there, there's that. It's there if you want. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, how long have you lived in the Seattle, Seattle area? Well I uh, grew up on Vashon Island mm -hmm. so you know half an hour away by ferry. Mm-hmm. I've lived in Seattle proper for about three years now, and I went to school in Tacoma. Oh, cool. So except for uh, two years that I spent as a missionary in Tokyo, I've lived in this uh, vicinity my entire life. Oh, wow. I didn't know you spent a year in Tokyo. Two years. Two years uh, in Tokyo. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, no, I was uh, I was raised Mormon, um, and so when I was 19, went on my mission to wow. Tokyo, Japan. Yeah. Wow, wow. Was that... Is that as, as amazing as it sounds? Yeah, no, it, it's crazy. I studied Japanese in high school, a year of it in uh, college, and then uh, you know got my got my call to Japan. It was a it was a blast. I love Japan, um, love Japanese. Although I am less fluent by the by the passing year. Every day that goes by, you know a little less Japanese. <laughs> exactly. No, I I got back in 2010, and I really haven't spoken it since. But wow. it comes back on the rare occasion I manage to come up with an excuse. Mm -hmm. And uh, how much do you know about local history? Sadly, little. Okay. Uh, I am. I had to take uh, PNW studies yeah, in yeah. Uh, in high school. Uh, that was the teacher was one of the worst teachers I've ever had. Uh, absolutely boring as all get out. Mm -hmm. uh, he would read the jokes he got forwarded an email back when email forwards oh. had first started being a thing. So oh, yeah. he'd be like, "Well." We have this thing we need to study today, but here's two pages of uh, Sven and Ollie jokes oh, wow. that I'm now going to read to the class. Oh, my brother-in-law sent me these lawyer jokes that you guys need to hear. Yeah, ex exactly. So that was that's most of what I remember. The only other thing I remember is uh, the, the final project of the class was a debate where everyone got split up into groups, and we had to debate who uh, should have gotten the uh, Northwest like territory. Between oh. Russia, Spain, England, and the United States. Oh, wow. And we won for Russia. <laughs> what? Uh, because uh, we we argued that Russia had the earliest claim to the territory. Yeah. That they had somebody here. Yeah. The earliest. And also, 
uh, Team America thought they weren't allowed to use Lewis and Clark. Why? The, so the, the teacher wanted, wanted them to not just use Lewis and Clark because, you know, he told them, like, you know, have a really well-rounded one. Don't just say uh, Lewis and Clark were here and they did all this stuff, therefore America wins, which they heard as don't use Lewis and Clark. Okay. And without Lewis and Clark, America's claim to the area is not, not super great. I also find it interesting that the, the First Nations weren't included in oh, that. No. That's, uh, because that seems like they would predate everybody by... <laughs> 12,000 years or so. Uh, I, I won't say anything else about that other than uh, this This same teacher would regularly remind us that he was married to a Blackfoot Indian. Okay. So I don't know how that speaks to the fact that First Nations weren't an option we could argue for. But okay. Yeah, it was... Uh, Interesting. We we won is the main, the main okay, thing. Okay, that's the takeaway. Take that, that, not yeah. necessarily that Russia had the most legitimate claim, but the, you were the best at arguing yes, that they had the exactly. most... Exactly. We we, Russia had the best lawyers. All right. Uh, and you have no idea what we're going to be talking about today, correct? I have no idea whatsoever. Awesome. Let's get started. Okay. Dave Beck was born in Stockton, California, June... I, I just, I just want to stop you right here. Are we just talking about this person because they're also named David? No. Okay, great. No, no. <laughs> uh, I always, I, I try to pick the right story for the right person. And a lot of times there's not a real clear reason why. Sometimes okay. there is, but okay. sometimes, but no, it's not just because <laughs> that's not, that's not. Hey, I found somebody named David. <laughs> I bet I know you'll like this one. Although I did pick John Considine for John Boyle, and uh, <laughs> so maybe in my subconscious that uh, that uh, and Matt Hatfield because there's a Hatfield in his story. So <laughs> maybe I did do that. I don't know. Uh, uh, okay. Anyway, we'll, we'll see. We'll... Uh, Dave Beck was born in Stockton, California, June sixteenth, eighteen ninety four. He didn't stay in California long. Uh, his family moved to Seattle when he was four, uh, four years old, to a small home in Old Belltown near South Lake Union. Okay. Uh, the intent was to make Seattle a stopping off point on the way to the Klondike Gold Rush, but they were unable to afford passage north and stayed here. So the Gold Rush started in 1897. That's when the big stampede started. Yeah. So they're making their way up, and they want to go to the Klondike, but they don't have the funds to make it up there. So we're, we're their, their backup option. Exactly, yeah. yeah. We're their, their car broke down in Seattle, <laughs> so they decided to make a home. I bed. guess we'll stay in Seattle. Mm -hmm. uh, the family home was in serious disrepair, and young Beck grew up poor. He took a series of odd jobs to help out with the family finances as a boy, selling newspapers, fishing, and peddling Christmas trees. One of the more unusual jobs was during the bubonic plague outbreak <laughs> Seattle was experiencing in the early 1900s, where he would shoot rats and collect a bounty of $5 for every rat that showed symptoms of carrying the plague. Wow. Yeah. Did he get anything for the rats that didn't show symptoms of carrying the so plague? So here's the thing. I found there's there's a lot of stories about people about about kids killing rats during the plague outbreak and getting mm -hmm. a, a reward for it. Some sources say ten cents, some sources say five dollars. Wow. So I'm not sure if this is if it's if it's you, you at, at other times you got ten cents per rat because they were trying to put to control the rat population, or and and then five dollars when the plague outbreak because like okay we got to get those rats that have the plague right because supply and demand now that now there's a real demand for dead rats right so yeah the price just jumped from ten cents to five dollars yeah or if this is just somewhere along the way this was adjusted for inflation and then those sources just happened to not translate that and say right. adjusted for inflation in 1972 or whenever this book was yeah, written. I mean that's that's a pretty big difference if you're like I'll pay you ten cents for this right or, or five dollars yeah I'm Depending on what the thing is, I'm probably going to be a lot more willing to do it for five dollars, right? Than yeah. I was for ten cents. Yeah, that's just economics. It's just yes, that's. I majored in economics, by the way. Clearly, so, uh, clearly, you all, did. All of the stories going through my mind filtered through the lens of could I get five dollars for killing rats? Yeah, okay. I mean, how uh, is that still the going rate? Because I, I can no, do that. I don't think you get anything for killing. You get this, you get a, a rat free. Area. Well, and you get you get peta on your tail at this point. Yeah. And so how dare you kill those rats? Uh, Beck's father worked as a carpet layer, and his mother worked at a laundry. Neither making much money. In his own words, "quote We were poor as hell." Uh, his main job was delivering the Seattle Times and Seattle PI, where he had around 350 customers on his route. His junior year of high school at Broadway High, he dropped out to drive a truck for the laundry his mother worked for. The laundry drivers went on strike for more pay, and he was out of work for three weeks. He thought the strike was a waste of time. He would later say, quote, you lose more in pay than you get from the raise in years. Uh, his belief became that if labor was organized enough, it would have enough power to prevent the need for a strike. All right. So he's, he's pro-labor, 
but he's he's against strikes, which makes perfect sense. Just yeah, speaking speaking from the perspective of economics, <laughs> a strike hurts everybody. You just hope it hurts the other guys more than you. Mm, is that the economic perspective? Yeah, I mean it's it's a stoppage of labor. You're producing nothing when you could be producing something. This is why I chose you for this story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean you know it's it's uh, it's game theory. You're you're uh, playing a game of chicken with the other mm-hmm. the other guy and just hoping he swerves first and mm-hmm. you get to look cool in mm-hmm. your 19. 19- 50s drag race mm. because game theory just appropriated chicken from 1950s greasers yeah <laughs> anyway let's, cool. hear, let's, hear, <laughs> let's hear about how well he does at that uh the laundry rivers went on strike for more pay and uh, then world war one broke out Oof. and beck joined the navy as a machinist mate so upon returning to seattle after the war he was fired up with entrepreneurial spirit he promoted the laundry he was driving for every chance he got and was making several hundred dollars a week. Soon he was elected business agent for the laundry driver's local 566 union. All right. So he's, he's, he's raising up in the laundry world. <laughs> <laughs> he used his position to talk to the laundry workers out of supporting the general strike of 1919 when the whole city was shut down. If you want to learn more about that, there's a whole episode on the general strike of 1919. Uh, He detested the industrial workers of the world, who he thought were antagonists and rabble-rousers instead of men and women capable of affecting real change. I mean, that's that's not horribly inaccurate. It's not, no. Uh, They're they're a controversial group. (laughs) Yeah, I mean... You know, not not. I don't want to say anything bad about them because they might still be in a beat people up kind of mood. I, I don't know if if they're... still around. They're <laughs> yeah. still around. Yeah. I, I don't know if they're as violent as some of their uh, some of their past history has been. I don't. Still, I don't but, think they are. But just on the safe side, I'm I'm not going to say anything more about that. If if you're listening, you guys are cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, so it, it, it's 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 a rational stance that if people are on the extremes and they're not willing to compromise and they're not if they're if they're like by any means necessary, then uh, he he thinks that they're not they're not helping. They're hurting their own causes more than than helping them. I mean, I'm not going to disagree with him on that one. Mm. Uh, he took evening and weekend classes in economics and public speaking and was outspoken in his support of unions and organized labor. And he was elected secretary of the laundry drivers union in 1924. All right. I don't know if that's moving up from business manager. But... It, oh, it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, great. Yeah. Business manager to secretary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's just one step below vice president. Oh, he wow. jumped the treasurer position. Yeah, well, I guess I guess we do have right underneath president and vice president, and then you have the secretaries of everything. Yeah, I mean mm-hmm. the the guy in charge of national defense is a secretary, mm-hmm. and the the business manager is what like secretary. No, the treasury secretary is still a secretary, but he's a lesser secretary. Yeah. And, well, and anyway, so he's doing pretty well in okay, the laundry yeah. drivers union. Uh, then the Great Depression hit. Oof. <laughs> uh, the mills, fisheries, and stores of Seattle shut down. Uh, many became homeless and more lost their job. Uh, in an effort to get back America back to work, FDR signed the National Recovery Act in 1933, which read in part, quote, Employees shall have the right to organize and bargain collectively through representatives of their own choosing and shall be free from interference, coercion, or restraint of employers of labor and their agents. So it's essentially, the, uh, the National Recovery Act is essentially reinforcing workers' rights. All right, bold move to take in a time of uh, economic it is, depression. It is, yeah, yeah. That's, I had much respect for FDR. Mm-hmm. Uh, Beck's power grew, and his attention turned to the bosses more than the workers to unionize a group. So normally when you people go into unionize, they go to the workers, and they're like, hey, we, you need to band together. But he would go to the bosses, and he would convince many a plant's boss that by allowing the workers to unionize and raise wages, it would increase stability in the workforce and prove to be more profitable in the long term. The okay, two things. First of all, uh, I have the utmost respect for somebody on on the side of uh, you know organized labor who really does their homework and re- like knows their way around economics. Mm-hmm. That's one of the biggest problems I had with the Occupy Wall Street thing. Mm-hmm. Is how many of those people when they talk are just like, could you just just pick up a book, please? Yeah. Uh, but I mean, also. Uh, Having the people on the side of the workers who know their way around economics, who are charismatic about it, is the thing that we need so much more of because there are so many good reasons to do things, to treat your yeah. workers well, to like pay them enough, to respect them. And I was, uh, I was watching something recently where someone basically said, why do we do so many studies of things that are obvious? Like, 
happy workers are better workers. Mm. You know, people like, ah, oh, why did someone spend, you know, however much money to study that? And it's like, well, because unless you have the economics to back it up, the boss isn't going to treat people their workers yeah, People well. aren't going to listen to it unless you have the actual yeah, hard data. You can be like, look at this graph, and then they'll be like, oh, you're right. We should treat everyone like a human being. <laughs> so I'm I'm loving this guy so far. Cool. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I had a roommate in college who was a, a, a self-proclaimed anarchist and super like, like, what are you trying to accomplish? He's just like, change the system to, to do what? we got to fight the power. Okay, what are you trying? <laughs> we got to take them down. Okay, that's... Awesome. Good for you. Uh, he was made general organizer for the Teamsters in 1926. Ooh, the big bad Teamsters. Big, big bad Teamsters. In 1927, he was made the full-time organizer of the Teamsters for all of the Pacific Northwest and British Columbia. Yeah, so definitely moving up from secretary. Oh, yes, definitely. Secretary of the Laundry Drivers Union. So now he is uh, the full-time organizer of the Teamsters for the entire North Northwest and British Columbia, All right. which is uh, U.S. and Canada, not Russia these days. <laughs> Should have so, been. Not, yeah, I know. I know how you feel about that. <laughs> uh, uh, he was a smooth operator. One associate would later say of him, Dave used, uh, quote, Dave used to say some of his best friends were bosses. Now I bet he tells bosses some of his best friends drive trucks. <laughs> Okay, so he's he's starting to lose his street credibility. Is that no, what we're not saying? necessarily. He's uh he's 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 just smoothing. He's rubbing elbows with people. He's get trying to get stuff done. Okay, it's a dangerous place to be for a champion of the working. It class. is, yeah. He's 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 going into risky territory. I, Many a men have fallen from yeah, getting this much power. I feel like if if we ever write like a musical about this guy's life, you know, we've we've just hit the intermission break where he's at the top of his game, and then coming into Act Two, we're starting to we're opening up with the number of all of like the minor characters in the labor union yes. talking behind his back and starting to whisper about oh he's going to these fancy parties now doesn't even come drink with us after work yeah anymore. and then thomas jefferson comes back from france and... <laughs> <laughs> you know I, I feel like some of this might have already been done <laughs> Uh, his attitude can be seen con contrasted with other labor leaders of the day. Beck was quoted as saying, quote, We recognize that labor cannot receive a fair wage unless business receives a just profit on its investment. Um, another organizer, Harry Bridges, countered, quote, We take the stand that we as workers have nothing in common with the employers. We are in a class struggle and we subscribe to the, the belief that if the, employers, if the employer is not in business, his products will still be necessary and we, will st we still will be providing them when there is no employer class. We rankly believe that day is coming. Wow, so they're very, going very much in the Marxist direction. Yeah, yeah, so they're exact opposite. So he's he's this one leader and then the other leader, and they're going in the exact exact different ways. Uh, he's yeah. saying that uh, we, we, we need to organize for labor, but the if you want to stay in business and have a job, then people are still going to need to turn a profit. And the other guy is saying, let's just get rid of all the employers altogether. I had this exact same argument with somebody in college uh, in a political philosophy class where I, I said something to the effect of uh, you'll always need somebody to be in charge. Mm -hmm. And these uh, these two anarchists who always sat in the corner and kind of made snide remarks at like everything uh, got real up in arms about the idea that there ever needed to be a boss of anything. Mm -hmm. Which, in in retrospect, I realized that what I actually meant was that the the job of, like, having the big picture and setting direction will always need to be somebody's job, because you can't do everything by committee. Uh, and their argument was, that person doesn't need to lord over us, which we were both right at the end of the day. Uh, so I, I feel like both of these guys have good points. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree a little bit more with the the reasonable. Let's uh, <laughs> let's not totally get rid of everything, but um, I'm, he's making a little too much sense right now. I, okay, I feel like uh, you're you're on edge right now. Yeah, you, no, you like this guy, and you're worried that he's going to break your heart. Well, I'm, I'm I'm worried that either uh, he's he's going to turn out to have been like insidiously in bed with the bosses all along. Okay. Or that he's making so much sense that he can't possibly succeed. Okay. Uh, because, you know, that's, that's, again, that's where we're at in the musical. Okay, uh, yeah. You know, he, like, we're, we're all on his side. We all, like, we're all totally getting it. And he's like, you know, if that guy was in charge, like, the world would be a better place. So, mm -hmm. I don't feel like this musical has a happy ending. I guess okay. that's what I'm saying. We'll, I, we'll, I feel like he gets shot in a duel with Aaron Burr at the we'll, end. We'll find out. Okay. We'll find out. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, the Teamsters could have some unscrupulous methods of getting what they wanted. Oh, yeah. Uh, the threat that Beck could have his men refuse deliveries to anyone who went against him was a useful tactic. So if you don't, if you disagree, just fine. You no longer get Teamsters delivering for you. Uh, hired muscle intimidated and beat up anyone who didn't vote the right way or who tried to drive a truck without joining the Teamsters. Uh, trucks were run off the road. Uh, the unofficial slogan was, vote no and go to the hospital. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I'm I'm a little bit less on board with this now. <laughs> uh, union leader Al Rosser was sent to prison for burning down a box factory that refused to hire the Teamsters and went non-union instead. Wow, that's uh, a if you if you know you're up against uh, if you're up against people who are willing to resort to violence and your factory is full of nothing but flammable <laughs> boxes. <laughs> yeah, that's you. <laughs> You, yeah, yeah okay. it's, so you're saying it's his fault? No, I'm, I'm not saying he shouldn't have been stocking that in his warehouse if he didn't want it to get burned. No, I'm, I'm more saying if, if you need someone to spearhead the anti-union movement, probably like have it be a factory that's a little bit harder, like to, a brickyard. Or... Yeah, like bricks or like things that are made out of metal. Mm-hmm. That, like they're gonna come in and be like, "Oh, we can't light this on fire." Yeah. We can't... We don't have anything harder than this to smash it with. The kindling factory and the lumber yard are both going to spite this fight. <laughs> yeah, so you know it's it's you got to you got to pick your battles mm-hmm. and you know know where your vulnerabilities are. Uh, the Teamsters hired boxer Leo Lomsky, also known as the Aberdeen Assassin, <laughs> to be a business agent during a strike and brought in a jujitsu expert to educate workers. <laughs> Okay. Uh, despite the Teamsters' known occasional use of violence, public opinion of them didn't diminish. Beck became so well known and popular that he was offered the job of Secretary of Labor by FDR. Okay, so he's moving up to secretary. Well, again. he turned the job down. Oh, whoa! And he would later turn it down two more times when he was offered the position by Truman and Eisenhower. Wow! So he's offered the job of Secretary of Labor three times, and he turns it down every time. Do we know why he's turning it down? He wants to stay where he is. Wow, he wants to be okay. fighting for the fighting for the workers on the ground. All right, I mean, you know, I, I respect that. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested now in the alternate history where this guy, oh, where he uh, he like, ends up as really gets some you know national control and uh, mm-hmm. and moving power. I think he m- maybe thought that he would have to compromise too much. You which... mean you mean stop stop breaking people's <laughs> knees when they didn't vote for him? Stop burning down factories. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, I feel like that. I, I agree with the idea that that would be unbecoming of the National <laughs> of Secretary, Secretary of Labor. Of Labor. <laughs> it just, just oh, I... Uh... Hey, everybody, let's run out the back door. The Secretary <laughs> of Labor is coming. Yeah, no, it just, I, I feel like, you know, congressmen are probably have a little more uh, in the way of ways to get back at you when you try and break their knees when, mm. they, uh, when they vote against you. Mm. So, you know... And anyway, I'm I'm still that that's the only reservation I have about this guy. So I'm going to keep harping okay, on it. Cause okay. His his, uh, his ideology is fine. The the beating people up thing is still uh, still getting to me a little bit. Okay. Oh, the newspapers were not fans of Dave Beck. Uh, the Seattle nice. Times and Seattle PI blasted him at every opportunity. William Randall Hearst had bought the PI in 1921, and the firing of a PI reporter for questionable reasons in 1936 caused a commotion. The Newspaper Guild brought the matter to the Central Labor Council, which Beck was hugely influential in, and Beck had agreed to have the Teamsters join the PI in protest. Okay, so not in strike, but they're going to go. They're going to join the protest. Uh, for the Newspaper Guild of the PI. Uh, 30 members of the Newspaper Guild formed a picket line, followed by Teamsters, and then by a whole slew of citizens who didn't like William Randall Hearst. <laughs> so just, like, random people? Are people, just yeah, we're up, just like, like, hey, what are you guys doing? <laughs> fuck William Randall Hearst. Yeah, <laughs> fuck William Randall Hearst! And so they're all joining this big... I, th- I feel like if that that's how you know you've got a worthy cause... If just like random other people are just showing up at yeah. your picket line to be like, you know what, you guys are right. Do you have a dog in this fight? Not really. No, I but... was going to get some fish, and I saw some people standing here, and I agree with you. <laughs> yeah, so they're they're doing something right, clearly. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hirsch bought airtime on radio stations and slammed the protesters and Dave Beck, accusing him of being a racketeer and a communist. Uh, Beck sued for libel and settled out of court for fifteen thousand dollars, which is. How much at this point? Uh, this is 1920. This is 1930 something. So, hundred thousand dollars, maybe. Okay, it's a it's a fair amount. I feel like, give, given his history at this point, he's got a pretty good argument against him being a communist. Yeah, like it, yeah. He's 
he, he's not a communist. But it was for a long. It was it was very fashionable to call people communists oh. that you didn't agree with for many many years. I mean, it's so, still fashionable to that's call true, people yeah. communists. That I you think don't it's agree less with. less of a. There's people now that walk around wearing communism oh, like yeah. a badge of honor. You know. So, but yeah, definitely. I mean, if you were a communist, you could lose your job. You could. There's all kinds of stuff that could happen. So it was very very big deal to accuse someone of being a communist. Although although where he's at, maybe he would do better if he'd just been like, yeah, I'm totally a communist. That's true. Yeah. In organized labor, he's probably having to fight against the the anti anti communist sentiment. Yeah. Like so we we're we really want you to help with this, but we're concerned you're not communist enough. <laughs> yeah. Well he's against the wobblies, and the wobblies are very socialistic. Yeah, so I mean I again I I feel like this guy is pretty like nice and like level headed middle of the road mm-hmm. and I'm I'm glad they, they settled in his uh non communist mm-hmm. favor. Oh the newspaper guild didn't have the money to buy radio time to counter, so they set to flooding the station with calls until the radio stations allowed them airtime to retort. The PI attempted to enlist the help of the Seattle Times and Seattle Star, but this proved unsuccessful. Hearst started what he called the Law and Order League, which began arming itself for the possibility of ending the strike by force. Dun dun. Mm. <laughs> uh, the strategy backfired, and the city's prosecuting attorney, John Francis Dorr, spoke on behalf of the strikers. Dorr said if the Law and Order League showed up armed, armed, the Seattle police force would relieve them of their weapons. He said, quote, I don't care if the Post Intelligencer ev- ever publishes, and I think it would be a good thing for the town if it didn't. Okay, well... So this is this is uh, back in the day when it was okay to just say stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, right. Just come out and be in favor of like, you know what? They can keep striking. If your business <laughs> shuts down, who cares? I'm the chief of police. I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna get a uh, 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 what's the thing I'm trying to say? Uh, get a marshmallow and put it on a stick and roast it on oh, the burning yeah. flames of your building. Yeah. Well, he's the prosecuting attorney. Okay. But uh, yeah, so he's just he's you know yeah okay you don't okay strikers yeah no you're not going to come in here armed and try to stop this strike it's one of those things where i i appreciate that we're more tactful now but just that you could just say how you felt yeah you can't really do that anymore which i mean i'm I'm okay in some ways yeah no I'm, i'm i'm okay with the fact that we we have gotten to the point as a society where it's not acceptable to be you know a government official who picks sides to that degree mm hmm uh, but I guess maybe we're we're covering up the problem maybe more than we've uh, moved beyond it. Mm. You know, uh, Hearst eventually yielded, and the PI began operating under new management. Uh, FDR's son-in-law, John Bodiger, took over and was allowed to run the paper with complete autonomy. So it's still owned by Hearst, but yeah. Hearst just has sort of taken hands off a little bit. Yeah. Because he lost the war of public opinion, okay. he couldn't. He couldn't come in with his weapons. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it, that only works if you're organized labor. That's true. Yeah, if you, you know, that's that's when you can show up with weapons and everyone's cool because <laughs> the prosecutors just look in the other way. There is kind of a double standard <laughs> going on right now. I mean, may, maybe it's more just an issue of how organized they are. If the mm. like labor is pulling together and getting weapons, we have sort of the like, oh, you know, it's a peasant revolt. They've got what do they got? Pitchforks. Mm. Uh, but you know, the the boss. They, they've got enough money to bring guns. That's unacceptable. Yeah. This is a knife fight. Yes. <laughs> uh, the PI, under Bodega's control, never attacked Dave Beck again and even pulled syndicated, col- syndicated column of submissions when they were unfavorable to Beck. Oh, wow. Yeah. Soon, though, Beck was in trouble with the law. Ooh, I, I could not have seen that coming. Yeah. There were charges against the Teamsters over price fixing in 1928, but they were acquitted on all charges. He was accused of raising the cost of living in Seattle. Uh, by raising wages and, and, and price fixing. Yeah, no one uh, complains about that anymore. No, I'm glad we've settled that, yeah. <laughs> uh, he responded, quote, What kind of a damn fool would I be to do that? Say we have 500 bakery drivers. Would I penalize the other 25,000 men I have in Seattle to benefit 500 by raising the bakery prices? Sure, there has to be regulation. Now I ask you, does Dave Beck set the price of Coca-Cola in Seattle? You pay exactly what they pay in Alabama for Coca-Cola. Five cents a Coke. Same with other products. Oh, wow. Five, Look, five cents a Coke. Five cents a Coke. Wow. Yeah. You could uh, you could get two Cokes for every rat you killed. That's true. Yeah. That's man. Like you see that rat? I'm drinking Coke tonight. Yeah. Or two hundred Cokes, yeah, depending. I mean, depending. Depending on, on whether it had the plague or not. <laughs> yeah. You just hope the bubonic rats hadn't gotten near your Coke before That's you got true. it. That's true. 
Uh, same with other products. Look at the national magazines. The prices are set nationally on products nationally. And if they are higher in the West, they're higher all over the West, not just up in Seattle. But the, those people who make Coke and things, they pay my people more wages. They pay them higher wages, but they charge the same price in Seattle that they do where they pay their workers half as much. Any intelligent person knows Dave Beck can't set prices. Wow. This is... Uh... No, this is taking me back to college economics right there. Oh, yeah? That, well, and, and to just, I mean, right now in Seattle, the $15 minimum wage. Right, bit, yeah. And, you know, some big thing just came out that prices are have not really significantly changed since the first steps of the minimum wage have gone into effect. I once had uh, one of my econ professors tell me that the minimum wage is the one issue the that he has heard economic uh, economists uh, yell at each other and call each other names over. Really? That, like, in general, like, econ conferences and things are, like, very, very civil. Like, everyone's very nice to each other. But the minimum wage is the one thing that will get, like, any economist, like, really, like, angrily uh, taking sides on. And it's and it's, it's a big debate. And every time somebody does a study, everyone who disagrees with the results is like, wait a minute, dude, look at, look at everything that's wrong with your study. And then uh, alternate studies and just... It's, I mean, I'm, I'm a hundred percent in favor of, of the living wage concept of yeah. if you're requiring someone to work as long as it's reasonable for someone to work, you should be paying them enough to live. Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but what that is and what that effect has on the business yeah. and that, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a very complicated issue. And, uh, yeah, it's a, according to my incredibly conservative Facebook friends, <laughs> uh, it will cause Seattle to break off and fall into Elliott Bay. <laughs> so that's uh, that's the study that I read recently. You know, I I feel like I should talk to my geologist friend about that <laughs> one because I think there may be some spurious connections going on. Maybe there. tenuous at best. Uh, uh, but you know, if 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 you can show me that study uh, that shows how the tectonics are going to work to to you know, if there's so much money on the one side that's just yeah, going to tip the plate tips over. into the ocean. <laughs> I would, I would love to see it. But now, th- just this is still very, very relevant. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and yeah. both sides of that debate are still very much alive and well. Mm-hmm. Right here in <laughs> Seattle. Uh, well, Beck didn't directly fix prices. He was candid about how he used his influence in the Seattle free market and exerted control over Teamsters to get his way. When new filling stations were potentially open up, he said, quote, We are going to close some of them. First, I advise promoters against starting new stations. If that doesn't work, the Teamsters unions will simply refuse to serve them. Them, and they won't last long. Oof. So he's kind of flexing his muscles, yeah. saying, you're not going to get your goods because I control the Teamsters. I say what goes around here. I mean, the ironic thing is, if you're a, you know, if you're a very pro-capitalist stance, then he's 100% within his rights to do that. Yeah. And any person engaged in business should be able to make any decision they want and serve mm-hmm. whoever or not serve whoever they want to. So you're, uh, you're kind of in a bind, yeah. capitalism. <laughs> Uh, Local Teamsters in the Northwest would only move local beer, and it prevented Pabst and Schlitz and other big-name Midwestern beers manufacturers from dominating the area. Man, what did all the hipsters do without their PBRs? That's one of the reasons we have Rainier, that Rainier was so big. because because you couldn't get anything else. The Midwestern, like, working-class beers couldn't make it out here because the Teamsters wouldn't deliver, so we had local beers... That that got big, and that's 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 one of the big reasons why Rainier became the big thing in the Northwest. All right, I I I kind of like the fact that we were even back then still kind of like uh, Northwest chauvinist. Like yeah, the, the, locally so, shopping local makes a difference. Yeah, you know the the whole like local vor thing. But you may have your Midwestern beers, but this beer was brewed in Seattle. <laughs> Uh, you know whether whether it's better or not, it's local. It's local. This this cabbage is local. It tastes like dirt. Local. local. <laughs> uh, after World War II, Seattle was ninety five percent organized. Wow. Uh, Beck was gaining attention nationally as a leader in the fight for unions and workers' rights. Dan Tobin, the leader of the Teamsters, and Bloody Mike Casey, who was. <laughs> Can I can I just hazard a guess as to how we got that nickname? Uh, no, I'm gonna pass. <laughs> uh, Bloody Mike Casey. How do you, how do you think he got that name? Well, I just just based by on by bloodying people. I, yeah, that that was that was gonna be it. Yeah, probably. Yeah, I, just based on what we know so far about the Teamsters. Which also, I just want to say, my my main reason for being against the Wobblies was was sort of their their tactics. Mm. And at this point, I'm I'm starting to to sense that there's not a whole lot of difference here. Well. 
There's there's differences ideologically, but as far as uh, <laughs> what the no, it's okay because we're beating him up for a different reason. Yeah, uh, Bloody Mike Casey, who was head of the Teamsters in San Francisco, tapped Beck to become Teamster organizer for all of the West Coast. Okay, so the Western Conference had 240 locals, and Beck was in charge of them all. Wow. By 1947, Beck was vice president of the Teamsters International, a job that was created solely with him in mind. <laughs> Five years later, he became president. Okay, so he's, he has moved up the chain from business manager to secretary yes. up to uh, vice president and then to president. Mm-hmm. Wow. The poor kid who used to shoot rats in South Lake Union had become the leader of the most powerful union in the country. He was well par- paid, wore fancy clothes, and attended fancy galas. Okay, so now we're, defi- we're definitely into the people whispering behind his back scene of the musical. Well, he said, quote, I'm well paid. The men like to have a fellow who negotiates for them show that he is in every way the equal of those with whom he deals. Hmm. Okay. Uh, he lived in a modest home, but outfitted it with a private movie theater and swimming pool. <laughs> so he bought a modest home and made it but, less modest. So, yeah, what's... Because in, in, my, in my head, of like, a private movie theater is, like... The big step that takes you from, like, I live in a house to I live in an episode of Cribs. Mm-hmm. Be- I mean, you, because in my head, when, you, when you're when you talking private movie theater, you're talking, like, miniaturized movie I, theater. I think... I, you got, like, I, yeah. the real seats and, like, the red velvet curtains. Yeah, and, like, but I think it's uh, it's it's not, you know, like a 200-seat theater, I don't think. Right, It's but, uh, maybe, maybe a maybe a 30-seat theater. I mean, at, at this point, how big's, a like, a movie projector, though? Cause, like, and, like, how expensive is that? Because, like, now I can go out and buy, like, a $200 projector. Right. Well, you, you'd probably be just, you know, uh, uh, maybe the side, maybe, like, two feet tall, one one foot wide, but then you'd have to have somebody standing there turning the yeah, crank. Yeah, you gotta have the projectionist? The, the... No, you, uh, back then I think they were, I think at this point they were using uh, carbon rod projectors. Okay. Which are the ones where uh, they have a, a carbon rod in them, and you have to keep the rod close enough to the plate in order for it to uh, connect ele- electrically, mm. and that creates the light, but then you have to have somebody constantly adjusting the rod because the rod burns down to right. move it closer, so it's probably one of those. Oh, jeez. So yeah, so that's that's so he's doing very well. Yeah, that that seems that seems a little extreme for a champion of the working man. Mm. Uh, by 1956, a staff attorney for the U.S. Senate Labor Committee looked into the Teamsters' practices and noted a, noticed a few things that didn't look quite right. Uh, the attorney's <laughs> name was Robert Kennedy. All right. Beck was living in a large home in Sheridan Park. Uh, Beck was the owner of the home originally, but at some point. The Teamsters Union bought it from him, and he was living in it house. He was living in the house rent free. Okay, so they they basically did the like the governor's mansion thing. Yeah, where the, the house belongs to the organization, but they just bought his house. They just bought his house. Okay. Yeah. Uh, on March twenty sixth, nineteen fifty seven, he stood before the Senate Labor Committee to explain this. They accused him of taking, in essence, an interest free loan estimated between three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars. Under oath, Beck took the Fifth Amendment 117 times. Wow. I mean, that, that's impressive. On the other hand, they could have just asked him the same question 117 times and him just taken the Fifth They every probably time. did ask him the same question in a different way over and over, hoping that it'll be like, yeah, I did it. <laughs> I wonder how many times that's happened. Where it's like, well, the first 116 times, I wasn't going to tell you. Yeah. But, you know, you found the magic number. Or they trick you. They right. Lawyers will trick you into, like, getting a back door, admitting to something, and then not being able to, I mean, you know. I mean, unless, unless he just, like, muscled a little bit and got the guy questioning him to be that prosecuting attorney who's mm. just like, yeah, I don't care if this burns down. Well, just get just get that guy to question me, and I'll answer everything he asks. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was revealed that he used his position to great profit. He would buy land near Teamster headquarters, and then deciding the Teamsters needed to expand, sell his privately owned land to the union at a huge markup. Uh, he bought mm. gas stations and would instruct his members only to buy gas from them. Okay. So he's really abusing his power at this point. Yeah, it's, uh, we're, we're getting to the, like, final final moments of the musical yeah. he's, he's he's coming up to the peak where we've got musical congress sitting there uh probably played by like all women or something just to just to get the casting more diverse mm. and okay yeah all right 
Can, uh, let's see. Let's see how the final <laughs> number goes down here. In May of that year, Beck had another hearing with the Congress of Industrial Organizers Ethical Practices Committee, where he once again refused to answer any questions. His membership from the CIO was, CIO was withdrawn, and the Teamsters were expelled from the group. Oh, wow. In March of 1957, he was in trouble with the IRS, facing an indictment with filing a fraudulent tax return in 1950 and allegedly selling a Cadillac that was property of the Teamsters and keeping the $1,900 profit for himself. Okay. Uh, he was also charged with evading $240,000 in back income taxes, but a judge ruled in his favor and the charges were dropped. Okay, so he's... Uh... He's, he's been maybe a little bit more sketchy than we've been led to believe. Yeah. The Cadillac charges, which Beth insisted was a clerical error, error stuck, and he was convicted of grand larceny. Oh, wow. uh, the tax evasion charge stuck as well, but Beck denied that until the day he died. The judge said at sentencing, quote, no boot black or newsboy of Horatio Alger's imagination ever rose from a more humble beginning to a greater height than Dave Beck. From the driver's place on a laundry wagon to the seats on, of the mighty national and international is a greater climb than even Alger conceived for any of his heroes. Did we not know now what we know of Mr. Beck, his success story would be as thrilling and inspirational as almost any in the history of American opportunity, enterprise, and ingenuity. The exposure of Mr. Beck's insatiable greed, resulting in his fall from high place, is a sad and shocking story that cannot be contemplated by anyone with the slightest pleasure or satisfaction. A fair appraisal of the evidence shows beyond glimmer of a doubt, as an incident of his tax fraud, Mr. Beck plundered his union, his intimate associates, and in some instances personal friends, most of whom quite readily would have freely given him almost anything he asked. As more than one of the union executive's witnesses put it, he could have written his own ticket. Yeah, that's uh, just set that to music and we've got our... That got really it. is, yeah. I mean, it, and that's eloquently sums up my feeling on the story, too. Is It's just such a great, like... Uh, you know, rags to riches, like wonderful ideals, like well, like well put and well executed, and then it ends the, yeah. like that. Uh, he was allowed to serve the two sentences concurrently and entered McNeil Island Prison on June twentieth, nineteen sixty-two. He told reporters on that day, uh, "What was it, General MacArthur said at Corregidor? I'll be back." Well, that goes for me, too. You don't have to fall down just because you've been knocked down. What matters is, do you get up again? I, I think he accidentally quoted Arnold Schwarzenegger where he meant to quote MacArthur, because I think MacArthur said, I shall return. Uh, oh, that's, he did say that, didn't he? Well, it was what, what he said, I believe in the words of the great uh, future governor of California. I'll, I'll be, be back. back. Yep. Did, he, did, did MacArthur say I'll return? I think he said I shall return. I shall return? Uh, as I recall. I remember there was the question of it should it be I shall return or we shall return, and he wanted to keep it as I shall return. <laughs> like, I specifically, not not the army in general, but me, because I'm so good, mm -hmm. will be back myself personally. Oh, Patton said I shall return. Didn't was he? It? Yeah. Because no. it was, uh, oh man. I don't. I, okay, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm. I'm going to put imaginary monopoly money on it having been MacArthur. Okay, all right. <laughs> I will put uh, sorry pieces on <laughs> on it being Patton. Okay, well, we'll look it up after this. And... Sounds good. And if you're listening at home, you put whatever kind of game piece you would like, and then look it up yourself. But uh, do do tell us before you look it up so that we can hold you to your bet. Right. Yes. Uh, he was succeeded as president of the Teamsters by Jimmy Hoffa. Okay. Who himself would go to prison on corruption charges in 1964. And then disappear without a trace. Yes. Uh, allegedly, Barry, we're at the 50-yard line at Giant Stadium. Is that where they think he's... <laughs> the the only the only reason, and uh, this, this is sad, but the only reason I know who Jimmy Hoffa is is because of a throwaway joke in Bruce Almighty. Oh, okay. Uh, where Bruce, being a news reporter, is using the uh, the powers he gets from God to create uh, fantastic news stories everywhere he goes. And he's uh, filming some stupid human interest story, and a dog Jim digs up the body of Jimmy Hoffa, like, right behind his interview subject. Mm. <laughs> or, or something like that. So that's the only reason I know who Jimmy Hoffa is. But since I feel like since everybody knows the name, that's, that's how our, uh, our musical ends, is... Uh, Jeff Beck goes to prison and is like, okay, we've got to step up the next guy. And okay, the, the future looks bright. This is going to end well. Who's the next guy? Jimmy Hoffa. Curtain. Mm, curtain, yeah. After two and a half years in prison, Beck was released on December 11th, 1964. 
Uh, he said, looking back on his life, quote, Looking back on my career, I have made many close friends, inside as well as outside of labor. Despite all the fighting that was directed against me by Seattle's business community in the state of Washington, I don't think there is a single person right now who has any more friends in Seattle business than Dave Beck. That, is to, that, is, uh, that has to say something about me. Then Beck died in 1993 at age 99. All right. Yeah. He made it all the way. He made it all the way. Almost made it to yeah, a century. Al- almost all the way, assuming 100 is, is the way. That that's, making yeah, it all that's the, so he didn't quite make it. Yeah, uh, no, so yeah. He, he didn't make it. That, it's a sad ending, you guys. <laughs> he died sad because he didn't make it to, to 100, 100 years, years old. old. Yeah, The only accomplishment that a human can be proud of. Yeah, but he really, it's, it's, it's he's a fascinating character because he really stuck by his principles and stuck by his principles and stuck by his principles and then kind of said... Nah, <laughs> I'm gonna use it for. I'm gonna use this this power I've gained because if you if you want to make money, somebody said told me a long time ago, uh, making a lot of money is easy if all you want to do is make a lot of money. Oh yeah, if that's the only thing you want to do. Then then yeah, it's not no, it's not that hard to get rich if all you care about is getting rich. Um, but he really. If, if, if he wanted, just wanted to get rich, he took the worst possible way <laughs> of getting there. And, and got it anyway. And got it anyway. Well, I mean, he, yeah, it's, so I, I just wonder at what point was it just, was it incremental or did he wake up one morning and say, fuck it? Or it probably just, just a little bit at a time. Yeah, I, I feel like the, the thing is we all like to think that we're, you know, gonna stick to our ideals. But, like, nobody wakes up in the morning and is gonna be like, you know, I'm gonna be a terrible person today. Yeah. I'm gonna defraud my friends and profit off of the backs of people who trust me. You know, and I, I think, especially when you're trying to hold to the middle ground like he was of being, you know, on the side of the workers and also being okay with, uh, with the business people and the, the more, you know, kind of unfortunate sides of capitalism, at some point that, that compromise is gonna draw you one way or the other. And, yeah, you know it's it's hard not to want to live the good life. I mean, that's, right, that's yeah. the American dream, right? Yeah, no, you know nobody wants to to be a communist and live in a dirt hut. Everyone wants to be a communist who lives exactly like they do now. That's true. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and I mean, there, if he's if he's constantly doing business and hobnobbing with these people oh, yeah. who are who are affluent and wealthy, and like he said, you know, I, I if I'm going to be negotiating with these people, I want to be dressing like them. I want to be living the same kind of life as them, so they'll treat me like an equal. Which, which or is, is that reasonable. a justification for? I mean, I, was doing. I think that's that's the sad thing is it's both. It's a reasonable position uh, that is right on the edge of the rabbit hole. Mm. So you know, let let that be a warning to us all. Yeah, uh, power you, power corrupts. You have been warned, listener. <laughs> well, thank you for listening to the Seattle Files. Thank you so much, David, for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, I'll be back next Tuesday with a new topic and a new guest. If you have a topic suggestion for something you would like to hear an episode about, shoot me an email at theseattlefiles at gmail.com. Uh, like us on Facebook, subscribe, uh, rate, and if you can't, leave a review on the show in iTunes. We're also on Stitcher if you're an Android user. Um, we are on Twitter at, at the Seattle Files, so follow us on there. Uh, I've got a couple of uh, live performances of the Seattle Files that are going to be coming up over the course of the summer, so definitely check on the Facebook page for that. I'll be announcing those as they come up. Thank you for listening. We'll be back next Tuesday with a new topic and a new guest. 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 And a 